In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Today is the fourth month, the first day, and the year 2018, and it's Resurrection Day. Christ is truly risen. And don't let the apostate Jews or anyone else lie to you. Christ is truly risen. As a matter of fact, I just spoke with him this morning. And the lecture the Lord has inspired me to do this uh, resurrection season is titled, Erroneous or Improbable Opinions Regarding Mary Magdalene and Mary of Bethany. Now, the modern day opinions regarding uh, Mary Magdalene and Mary Bethany are either erroneous or improbable. And uh, number one, they teach that Mary Magdalene was a notorious sinner. That's improbable. You're going to learn that in this lecture. Very improbable. They teach that Mary Bethany, the sister of Lazarus and Martha, was the same person as Mary of Magdalene, and therefore Mary of Bethany was a notorious sinner. This is erroneous because they weren't the same persons. We're going to prove that too. But some people teach that Mary of Bethany was, even though she wasn't Mary Magdalene, she was still a notorious sinner. She was a sinful woman who anointed Jesus' feet as recorded in Luke 7. And that also is erroneous. And they also, some of them teach, this is a common thing today too, Mary Magdalene moved to France and died there. And that's an improbable opinion. You're going to learn that in this lecture also. And part of that story of her going to France, you remember, was that she went into a cave and did penance for 30 years, presuming then that she was a notorious sinner. So the big thing in here is to just prove that there is no evidence whatsoever in the Bible, and even the opposite, that Mary Magdalene or Mary of Bethany were notorious sinners. And quite the opposite, that they were very holy and they were never sinners at any time. Now, even if Mary Magdalene was a notorious sinner and repented, she could still be very holy. I'm not questioning that. But just this is for the record and for the truth of the matter. Now, from the information I have, these common opinions, these opinions did not be, become common until the 12th and the 13th century. That's, that's when they became common. Before that, and from the information I have, the first church father that taught that Mary Magdalene was a notorious sinner was Pope St. Gregory the Great in 591. And he's the only church father I found that ever taught that she was a sinner. No one, no one else. Not even the anti-church fathers. Not even the anti-church fathers. Now, and from the information I have, the first church father who taught that Mary of Bethany was a notorious sinner was St. Augustine in the year 400. He taught that she was the sinful woman mentioned in Luke 7, but he did not teach she was Mary Magdalene. St. Augustine taught Mary Magdalene was not a sinner. He didn't teach that. But he, thought, but he believed Mary of Bethany was a notorious sinner. And he's the first one that taught that from the information I have. And so, and I say in here, as far as my research has taken me so far, I found no other church father that taught me, or anti-church father, that taught that Mary Magdalene was a notorious sinner, or that Mary Bethany was a sinner. These are the only two, from, and I've been doing some research, pretty extensive, I'm not saying I researched everybody. But from what I'm looking at now, these opinions did not become common until the 12th and 13th century. Now let's go over what we're talking about, the women involved in these stories and how they confuse and mix up these women. The first one we're going to talk about is the unnamed sinful woman who washed, kissed, and anointed Jesus' feet in Galilee at the beginning of his ministry when St. John the Baptist was alive, and Jesus forgave her because of her great love for Jesus. This is mentioned in Luke 7, 36 to 48. Then number two, we have the uh, unnamed woman who was caught in adultery. And this happened in Judea when John the Baptist was dead, and Jesus forgave her and told her to go and sin no more, as recorded in John 8, 1 to 11. Now we have Mary Magdalene, who's mentioned several times in the Bible, who had seven devils cast out of her, as recorded in Mark 16, 9 and Luke 18, 2. Then we have St. Mary of Bethany, and, and it's also referred to as Bethania, but Bethany is what I'm going to be using in this lecture. St. Mary of Bethany was the sister of Lazarus and Martha, and she anointed Jesus' feet a day before Palm Day, as recorded in John 12, 1 to 8. Now we have another woman, an unnamed woman, doesn't say she was sinful, so there's nothing here about her, this woman being sinful, an unnamed woman who anointed Jesus' head two days before his crucifixion, as recorded in Matthew 26, 6-13, Mark 14, 2-9. Alright, we're now going to go over the erroneous and improbable opinions one at a time. 
Now, the first thing, reason, the main reason why I think Mary Magdalene was a notorious sinner was because seven devils were cast out of her. And they say, so therefore, because seven devils were cast out of her, she had to be a notorious sinner. And I'm going to prove to you that's an erroneous statement. Erroneous, not even improbable, that statement. First of all, there's no explicit evidence in the Bible that says Mary Magdalene was a notorious sinner. Instead, there's good evidence that proves she was a non-notorious sinner and even holy. However, many believe that she was with certainty that she was a notorious sinner because Jesus cast seven devils out of her. We read about that in Mark 16, 9. But he rising early, first day of the week, appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he cast seven devils. But this belief that she had to be a notorious sinner because she was possessed is erroneous because God allows devils to possess holy men. And he does this for five reasons. He allows devils to possess holy men to test their faith, to keep them humble, to increase their trust in God, to gain grace for themselves and for others, and because of the sins of others. And also, God allows devils to possess evil men because of their own sins. So they're forgetting this part that just because you're possessed by devils does not mean you're evil or a sinner. You could be a very holy person. We're going to give you a quote from the Malus Maleficarium in the 15th century that a guy that authored this, or her, it's a uh, nominal Catholic book. It has heresies in it, but there's a lot of good stuff too. And this statement happens to be true uh, from the Malus Maleficarium, and it says, We shall rehearse five reasons why God allows men to be possessed. For sometimes a man is possessed for his own greater advantage, sometimes for the slight sin of another, sometimes for his own venial sin, sometimes for another, another's heavy sin, and sometimes for his own heavy sin. For all these reasons, let no one doubt that God allows such things to be done by devils. Now, I'm going to give you where that was located in that book, and it was in part, uh, the second part, part two, uh, question one, chapter two. And he goes over a lot of examples of holy men that were possessed by demons who God, God allowed them to be possessed. Now, we have in the Bible several examples. Holy Job. God allowed Satan to possess him and, and afflict, not, kill not only all his whole family and afflict his cattle, and he also allowed the devil to attack his flesh and his health and to, to disturb his mind and to, to he, he got afflicted with physical and mental infirmities from Satan. That's Job. Now, I think you all know that well enough, so I'm not going to quote that whole quote. I do want to quote one thing from Job, though. If you want to read about how Job was holy and how God allowed him to be afflicted, you got to read Job 2, 1 to 7. I think most people know that about what happened with Job. But because Job was possessed and obsessed by, by devils who inflicted him with grievous physical and mental torments, his friends thought he had to be an evildoer. He had to be full of iniquity. We read about that in Job 22, 1 to 5, when Eliphaz the Themite answered and said to Job, God reprove thee for thy manifold wickedness and thy infinite iniquities. But we all know from Job also at the end of the last chapter when they're debating about this that God said, no, Job was not an evil though. He was a very holy man. I allowed the devils to possess him to test his faith. In this case, it was to test his faith. And it helps to increase your trust in God and keep you humble too. But in this case, we know it was to test his faith. Because Satan said, hey, look, Job's a holiest man and just man on the whole earth because you haven't touched him. You didn't let me come in here and beat him up. Let me go in here and possess and obsess and beat him up and then see if he still gives you glory. And Job did. Now, at the end of the whole book of uh, Job, the, near the ending part, this is when uh, God himself says how holy Job was. And this is in Job 42, 7 to 8. And after that, the Lord had spoken these words to Job. He said to Eliphaz, the Themite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, because you have not spoken the thing that is right before me, as my servant Job had. Have Take unto you therefore seven oxen and seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer for yourselves a holocaust. And my servant Job shall pray for you, and his face I will accept, that folly be not imputed to you, for you have not spoken right things before me as my servant Job hath. So Job was not full of it, because they thought he was. Now this is the same thing they do to Mary Magdalene, because she's possessed by seven devils. They go out and say, oh, guess what? She had to be a notorious sinner. Not so at all. We have other examples in the Bible. We, have, we, we read another holy man, or at least a non-notorious sinner, in which Jesus cast out devils that caused him to be blind and dumb. The, the devils that were afflicting him brought upon him blindness and dumbness. We read about this in Matthew 12, 22. Then was offered to him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb. And he healed him so that he spoke and saw. But nobody called this man a notorious sinner because there's no. it never said it in the scripture. All it said that his possession caused this physical infirmities. The man born blind... Whom Jesus healed is another proof that God allows holy men to be possessed 
by devils that cause physical infirmities. We read about this in John 9, 1 to 7. And Jesus passing by saw a man who was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked them, Rabbi, who has sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither have this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. And so then God did the miracle and cured him. And he says, So I can manifest my power through him, but it's not because he's a sinner. So God allowed the devil to possess him and cause blindness. Now, we have other examples in the Bible where there are evil people, sinners, that are possessed by devils because of their own sins. We read about this in John 5, 2 to 14. A certain man had been eight and thirty years under his infirmity. Him, when Jesus had seen lying and knew they had been now for a long time, he saith to him, Wilt thou be made whole? The infirm man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me in the pond. For whilst I am coming out, another go down before me. And Jesus said to him, Arise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately a man was made whole, and he took his bed and walked. Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest some worse thing happen to thee. That's in John 5, 12 to 14. And we have another proof uh, that devils possess holy men and holy women. In this case, it's a holy woman who was possessed by devils that caused her to be bent over, if you remember that story. When Jesus cast the devils out of her, she stood upright and was able to walk. That's in Luke 13, 10 to 16. And he was teaching in their synagogues and their Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity, 18 years, and she was bowed down together. Neither could she look upwards at all. Whom, when Jesus saw, he called her unto him and said to her, Woman, thou art delivered from thy infirmity. And he laid his hands upon her. Immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue, being angry that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, answering, said to the multitude, Six days there are wherein you ought to work, and then therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. And the Lord answering said to him, You hypocrites, doth not every one of you on the Sabbath day loosen his ox or his ass from the manger and lead him to water? And ought not this daughter of Abraham, who Satan has bound, lo, these eighteen years be loosed from the bond on the Sabbath day? Here's another woman. Her possession didn't mean she was an evildoer or a sinner. It, was, it just caused physical infirmities on her, either to test her faith or to keep her humble, to increase her trust in God, to gain grace for herself or others, or because of the sins of others. But nowhere did anybody ever imply it, and anybody say she was a notorious sinner. So my point is, why did he do that with Mary Magdalene when he don't do it with these other people? Just because you're possessed by devils and you have physical and mental infirmities does not mean that you're a notorious sinner. Sorry, it doesn't mean that. You can't, if you say that, it's, 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 you're doing a, it's like calumny, okay? We're going to get into what types of sins people commit when they do that. Now, I got other proof too in this Bible. There's only two verses in the Bible that talk about Mary Magdalene being possessed by demons, seven devils. And this other verse I'm going to quote has, is a little bit more proof even that she, quite a bit more proof that she was not a notorious sinner. Because it says he cast out the evil spirits from her and her infirmities were healed infirmities, just like this woman bent over. Nowhere does it say she's a notorious sinner. This is in Luke 8, 1-2. And it came to pass afterwards that he traveled through the cities and towns, preaching and evangelizing the kingdom of God. And twelve were with him. And certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary, who is called Magdalene, out of whom seven devils have gone forth. Infirmities. He cast the devils out. She was cured of infirmities. Just like the woman bent over, just like the blind and dumb man. Doesn't say she was an evil sinner. So why, when it comes to her, do you make her a notorious sinner? No evidence. So that's why I say, when you say she had to be a notorious sinner because of that, erroneous. I just gave you enough examples to prove that. Besides the fact that nowhere in the Bible does it ever say she is a notorious sinner. Now, because people believe that Mary Magdalene was a notorious sinner... They either believe, they, some of them believe that she was a sinful woman who anointed Jesus' feet, as recorded in Luke 7. And I call this improbable. And I start out with, even if Mary Magdalene were a notorious sinner, you can't say she was a sinful woman in Luke 7 who anointed Jesus' feet because she's unnamed. It does not tell you who this woman is. And if God wanted you to know who the woman was, he would have had her name put in there, okay? So even if Mary, she was for some other reason, you can't attach her to this woman in Luke 7. Now, when I quote this event, note that the event took place in Galilee in the house of Simon the Pharisee, 
In the beginning of Jesus' ministry, when John the Baptist was alive, and Jesus forgave the sinful woman because of her great love for Jesus. This is Luke chapter 7, and it's basically from, um, you can read uh, 36 to 48, but I'm going to start out with Luke 7, 11. And it came to pass afterwards that he went to a city called Naim in Galilee, and there went with him his disciples in a great multitude. Verse 19, And John the Baptist called to him two of his disciples and sent it to Jesus, saying, Art thou him that shall come, or are we to look for another? I just recall that to show you John the Baptist was still alive. This is important for later on. That this event took place in the beginning of his ministry when John the Baptist was alive. Now we get into the re recording this event of this unnamed sinful woman. And this is in verses 36 to 48. And one of the Pharisees desired to eat with him, and went into the house of a Pharisee and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman that was in the city, a sinner, when she knew that uh, he sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. And standing behind at his feet, she began to wash his feet with tears and wiped them with her hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. And the Pharisee who had invited him, seeing, spoke within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know surely who and what manner a woman this is that toucheth him, that she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, now we know the name of this Pharisee, Simon the Pharisee, and he's in his house. I have somewhat to say to thee. But he said, Master, say it. A certain creditor had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And whereas they had not whereat to pay, he forgave them both. And which therefore of the two loved the most? And Simon answering said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave the most. And he said to him, Thou hast judged rightly. And turning to the woman, he said to Simon, Dost thou not see this woman? I entered into thy house, thou gavest me no water from my feet. But she with tears hath washed my feet, and with her hairs hath wiped them. Thou givest me no kiss, but since she came and she has not ceased to kiss my feet, my head with oil, thou didst not anoint, but she has anointed, but she hath anointed my feet. Wherefore I say to you, to thee, many sins are forgiven her, because she hath loved much. But to whom less is forgiven, he loveth less. And he said to her, Thy sins are forgiven thee. Now, here's the whole quote. Where's Mary, where was Mary Magdalene in this? Nowhere. How, you, how could you say that this is Mary Magdalene, right? And if God wanted you to know it was her, then he would have put her name in here somewhere. Now, so that's the basis. For, that, so a lot of people link her with this woman. But some people don't link her with this sinful woman who anointed Jesus feet in Luke 7, but they link her with the adulterous woman. The woman was caught in adultery as recorded in Luke 8. Now this event took place in Judea in the temple when John the Baptist was dead and thus sometime after the sinful woman mentioned in Luke 7 anointed Jesus' feet and Jesus forgave her her sins. And Jesus also forgave the adulterous woman and told her to sin no more. We read about this in John 8, 1 to 11. And Jesus went on to the Mount of Olivet and early in the morning he came on to, on to the, again into the temple. And all the people came to him, and sitting down he taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees bring on to him a woman taken in adultery. And they, and they set her in the midst and said to him, Master, this woman was even now taken in adultery. Now Moses and the law commanded us to stone such a one. But what sayest thou? And that, this they tempting him, that they might accuse him. But Jesus, bowing himself down, wrote with his finger on the ground. When therefore they can... They continued to ask him, and he lifted up himself and said to them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. And again stooping down, he wrote on the ground. But they, hearing this, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest. And Jesus alone remained, and the woman standing in the midst. Then Jesus, lifting up himself, said to her, Woman, where art thou that accused thee? Hath no man condemned thee? Who said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither will I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Now, in this whole thing that I just read, and I'll tell you who the woman is. It's a rash judgment, and it's wrong to say that this is Mary Magdalene. Or even to say it may have been Mary Magdalene, unless there's some other evidence that points to it, and there is none. Now, some people believe, which is really erroneous and illogical, that Mary Magdalene was both a sinful woman in Luke 7 and the adulterous woman in John 8. They believe it's the same person, and they're all Mary Magdalene. Now, it's certain that this Mary Magdalene cannot have been both of these persons. Because these two persons are not the same person. The sinful woman in Luke 7 lived in Galilee when she anointed Jesus' feet. The adulterous woman lived in Judea and she was brought in the temple. 
where Jesus ca uh, healed her and, and, and forgave her in the temple in Judea. Secondly, if it was the same person, you'd have to say the sinful woman who Je Jesus forgave in Luke 7, and now she was forgiven in the beginning, went back to her sinful ways, and he had to forgive her again down in Judea. It's erroneous. It's not the same person. So the sinful woman mentioned in Luke 7, who anointed Jesus' feet in the beginning of his ministry, is not the adulterous woman who Jesus forgave near the end of his ministry and Judea in the temple. So Mary Magdalene was not both of, the, both of those persons. Now we get into the other thing. People say, well, Richard or anybody who holds what I'm saying here now, well, Mary Magdalene had to be a notorious sinner or God's mercy will be undermined. You're undermining God's great mercy is he's showing that how great a sinner could be so converted and become so holy. I'm not denying that. Nobody denies that. The Bible is loaded with examples of notorious sinners who repent and become very holy. King David was a great sinner when, he, just for that one period of time, he committed those horrible sin with Bathsheba. And after God forgave him, yes, he rose him back again. We're not denying God's mercy. According to what you're saying, then, is that there was just one just person in the whole Bible. Like we know St. Joseph was in the Blessed Virgin Mary, then God's mercy is undermined because he could not forgive them of any sins because they were not guilty of any sins. And God's mercy would be undermined, especially in heaven, because nobody's guilty in heaven and needs his mercy to be forgiven because they're all perfect. It's a stupid statement that I'm undermining God's great mercy. We're not undermining God's great mercy. But it's, in other words, there's other examples like we just gave you, the adulterous woman, the woman who anointed his feet. He forgave them. The Bible's loaded of sinners that were forgiven and raised up to high rank by God. It doesn't undermine his mercy. As a matter of fact, that statement they make really hangs them. My opinion really defends me. My point is this. Okay, so you're trying to tell me that, that one of the main purposes of St. Mary Magdalene was that to show God's great mercy towards notorious sinners. So he wanted to show you that we got this horrible, adulterous, or other kind of a sinful woman, that when God then goes and remits your sins, he lifts her up and makes her... Second to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Well, I'm not, I, don't, I don't doubt that neither, that God does that to these people. But if God wanted to use St. Mary Magdalene for this example, why did he not see to it that in the Bible, in the New Testament, it's not mentioned even once, even once that she was a notorious sinner? Never. All it says, she was cast out seven devils. So the example is, does it work? It actually condemns these people to say, if God wanted to use her, he would have said and Mary Magdalene was caught in adultery and guest. I cast the seven. He did not say it. He did not record it. So if God wanted to use her as an example, he didn't use such a good example by make, letting us know that for sure she was a notorious sinner. We're not undermining his great mercy. Most of us were great sinners. My sin, every, I broke every commandment God's thing. I know he could forgive and lift you up. If I didn't, I'd go into despair and I would, I would mock God's mercy. So we're not denying God's mercy. So don't pull that stuff on us, okay? As a matter of fact, the fact that God didn't mention her as a notorious sinner proves that, to me, this is one of the strongest proofs, strongest proofs that she was not a notorious sinner, that she was very holy. This is one of the strongest proofs, to me. Because nowhere in the Bible does it ever say it. Now we're going to get into St. Mary of Bethany, Lazarus' sister. Now some people believe that Mary of Bethany was Mary Magdalene, the same person. So therefore, Mary of Bethany was a notorious sinner. Now, first of all, we'll just give you some facts on this. Mary of Bethany lived in Judea in Bethany and was the sister of Lazarus and Martha. We read about this in John 11, 1 and 19. Now there were a certain man sick named Lazarus of Bethania, of the town of Mary and of Martha, her sister. And many of the Jews were come to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. That's just to let you know the family there. One of the strongest, one of the proofs we have that Mary Magdalene was not Mary of Bethania, Bethania was that Mary of Bethania lived in, Bethania lived in Judea, in Bethany. However, Mary Magdalene lived in Magdala, in Galilee. So they didn't live in the same place. Now we're reading from the nominal Catholic Encyclopedia on Magdala. The existence of a Galilean Magdala the birthplace or home of St. Mary Magdalene is indicated by Luke 8.2, and it, it's just all the verses where Mary of Magdalene is. 
is indicated in Luke 8, 2, Mark 16, 9, Mark 27, 56, and 61, Mark 28, 1, and the parallel passage John 21 and 18. Christian tradition sought there the home of Mary Magdalene. So they didn't leave, live in the same areas, in the same towns. One was in Galilee, one was in Judea. We read again from the Nominal Catholic Encyclopedia on St. Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene was so called from Magdala near Tiberias on the west coast shore of Galilee. So they didn't live in the same place. They totally lived in totally different places. And nowhere in the Bible, this is mostly important too, and nowhere in the Bible when Mary Magdalene is mentioned, does it ever say, ever, that she is the sister of Martha and, and Lazarus? Never. And she's mentioned many times, and she's a very important figure, especially during the resurrection when she's the first to witness the empty tomb. It doesn't say Mary Magdalene, but the, the sister of Lazarus, the sister of Mary. And when you're here, learning a story about Martha and Mary of Bethany and Lazarus that never says it was Mary Magdalene. They never, ever make the connection. It's not made. They, they made it up again. This is, to, this, this is uh, they pulled it out to, to try to, now this is what's bad about this is to bring a Mary of Bethany into this. And now they're making her a notorious sinner when there's no evidence of that. So you would expect at least once in a Bible it would say Mary Magdalene was the sister of Lazarus or the sister of Martha. They do that many times in a Bible. Not once. Not once. It doesn't tell you. All it tells you about Mary Magdalene, it, 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 they don't say who her sisters or brothers or her parents were. Never. And when they're mentioning the other Mary of Bethany, it never says she was Mary Magdalene. So that opinion is erroneous. But other people say, and this one has a, maybe a little piece of evidence for it, but it's still bad. This is the one St. Augustine taught. Some people believe that Mary of Bethany was a sinful woman who anointed at Jesus' feet in Luke 7. In the beginning of his ministry, that's erroneous. But they don't believe she was Mary Magdalene. So St. Augustine said, no, Mary of Bethany is not Mary Magdalene. But she's the same woman mentioned in Luke 7 who anointed his feet in the beginning of his ministry. And so therefore, when John records Mary of Bethany anointing the feet at the end of the ministry, a day before Palm Day, he says, therefore, she just anointed his feet again. So he's presuming that she was the unnamed sinful woman in Luke 7 who anointed at Jesus' feet when John the Baptist was alive and, got, and Jesus forgave her, and then she became very holy. He does say that. And then at the end of the ministry, about a day before Palm Day, that's that Mary Bethany, who he believes was the same woman, anoints his feet again. And it, because of those two passages, he makes that connection. That, that's it. That's the only evidence he has. Because it sounds the same. Because Jesus' feet is being anointed. But you're gonna, here's how we're going to go over this a little bit right now. Okay, Now, some base their erroneous, uh, this error upon the fact that a woman anointed Jesus' feet in both events. Well, many men and women anoint, anointed Jesus' feet as it was a custom of the Jews to wash or anoint feet of visitors and to greet them with a kiss. Hence, the opinion that Mary Bethany was a sinful woman is unfounded because there is no way of knowing with certainty who the unnamed sinful woman mentioned in Luke 7 was. And this opinion is erroneous because the sinful woman mentioned in Luke 7 lived in Galilee and Mary of Bethany mentioned in John 12 lived in Judea. This sinful woman would then have moved her residence from Galilee down to Judea and, and, and Mary of Bethany and now she's now down here living with Lazarus. It, 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 they didn't live in the same areas. The sinful woman, when you read the scripture, she's up in Galilee. Uh, Mary Bethany is down in Judea and Bethany. So they're, they're living, she's living in different places. It's a different woman. And some base the error that Mary Bethany was a sinful woman mentioned in Luke 7 by taking out of context John 11 2. This is the one where I think Augustine was fooled. Where you, you could take this one out of context, but it's still you shouldn't. But I will, I'll mention it here. And some base the error that Mary Bethany was a sinful woman mentioned in Luke 7 by taking out of context John 11 2. Because John 11 2, this is before John 12, says Mary of Bethany anointed Jesus' feet before John 12 mentions the actual event of her doing so. Some believe that John 11, 2 is referring to an event that already occurred, and thus Mary of Bethany was a sinful woman who anointed at Jesus' feet in the beginning of his ministry as recorded in Luke 7. We're going to give you the quotes now. Here's John 11, 1 to 2. Now there was a certain man sick named Lazarus of Bethany, of the town of Mary and Martha, her sister. And Mary was she that anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Now that sounds almost similar to the unnamed sinful woman uh, who anointed Jesus. Because she anointed his feet. That's basically the only similar. But what's happening here is he's saying it before she actually did it in John 12. 
So St. Augustine is thinking that th this is, this, he's referring to that previous event, not the future event. Now we're going to read about John 12, 3, where here's where he actually talks about Mary doing the anointing. This is John 12, 3. Mary therefore took a pound of ointment of right spikenard of great price and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Here's what's happening here. In John 11, uh, St. John's really merely mentioning the event that everybody well knew about. He's writing the gospel after all has happened. So you remember, she's the one that anointed Jesus' feet. So it's not in time, it's not what I call an out-of-sequence event. He tells you about what happened before it actually happened. And he's telling you to bring to their mind, you remember this Mary, whose Lazarus was sick? She's the one who anointed Jesus' feet two days, a day before a palm day. He didn't add that, but he's just mentioning an event they all knew about, but it's out of sequence. It's not in sequence. And I call that out of sequence events. Now, we have a commentary on this. This is a heretical book. It's a nominal Catholic book, but it's heretical. But on this case, they're correct. It's called the Jerome Biblical Commentary, Commentary in John 11, 2. This verse has often been misunderstood. John refers to an event, event that he supposes his readers to know well, though he himself has not yet mentioned it. He speaks of the anointing of Bethany at Bethany in, in 12.3. There is no reason to think that he attempted to identify Mary, the sister of Lazarus, with the unnamed Galilean woman in a similar narrative recounted only by Luke 7, 37 forward. He's saying there's no reason to link the both of them. Just, be, just because he mentioned this event before she actually did it. Now here's what I say here on this. John 11, 2. In, in John 11, 2, St. John uses the word was. And Mary was she that anointed the Lord. Because when he wrote his gospel, this event indeed had already occurred. But he did not mean that this event occurred before Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Many events are mentioned in the Bible before they occurred. I call these out-of-sequence events. For example, Luke 3, 19-20 says, John the Baptist was shut up in prison. Then we go on to the next two verses in Luke 21-22, and it says Jesus was baptized, and thus by John the Baptist, and hence John was not in prison. I'm going to read it. This is what I call out-of-sequence events. This is a good example. I have a lot of them. I'll give you a main one here. But heard the Tetrarch, when he's reproved by him, for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, he added this also above all, and, and shut up John in prison. So John the Baptist is in prison, right? Now it came to pass, when all the people were baptized, that Jesus also being baptized, and praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in the bodily shape as a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven, Thou art my beloved Son, thee am I well pleased. So now God, John, the very next two verses, John, who baptized Jesus? John the Baptist. So how could he be in prison? Out of sequence events. Very important. I have a lot of these in the Bible. Anybody who reads the Bible knows this. So when John's telling you about, the, uh, oh, Mary, uh, Mary uh, Lazarus' uh, sister, she's the one who anointed his feet. We're going to get into that later. And he does. Uh, you'll see what, there's more evidence I got here on the way. Here then is an example of an out of sequence event. Because John the Baptist was not shut up in prison until after he baptized Jesus. In the same way, St. John mentions in John 11, 2, the anointing of Jesus' feet by Mary of Bethany before it actually occurred, as mentioned in John 12, 3. I'm going to have this up as an article, and you can read it, and you'll see it. In John 11, 2, and in John 12, 3, which is the actual event that took place, it only says the woman, Mary of Bethany in this case, anointed Jesus' feet. John 11, 2. And Mary was she that anointed the Lord's ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Now the event, here's the event itself in John 12, 3. Mary therefore took a pound of ointment of right spikenard of great price and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with odor of the ointment. But in Luke 7, it says the sinful woman washed, kissed, and anointed Jesus' feet. Luke 7, 38. And standing behind at his feet, she began to wash his feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. So that's not the same anointing that's being mentioned in 11, 2. The one mentioned in 11, 2 is the one that took place in John 12, 3. You read it, you'll see. It's not the same person. The only per And Augustine linked these two, and he presumed that it sounds so kind of similar so Mary of Bethany, even though she's not Mary Magdalene, was this unnamed sinful woman in Luke 7. And St. Augustine, from my is the only first one that taught that. And I don't know who else. Other people follow 
people believe a lot of things, uh, different things. Now, sometimes they believe all three or they're all the same person. And I go like this. Lastly, even if John 11, 2 means that Mary of Bethany had, an, Bethany had anointed Jesus' feet previous to anointing them the day before Palm Day, I mentioned in John 12, one cannot infer with any certainty that she was the unnamed sinful woman mentioned in Luke 7 who anointed Jesus' feet. Okay, now we're going to get into the improbable opinion that Mary Magdalene moved to France and died there. This is a common, this belief you're going to learn started also in the 12th or the 13th century. We're, we're going to quote on that in a second. They believe that Lazarus, here, here, this is based upon a belief that Mary of Bethany was Mary Magdalene. So therefore, when, and they believe Lazarus, and I don't believe Lazarus went to France neither, nor Martha. I don't believe any of them went to France. This is a modern day, it's not, it's not tradition. This is not based in tradition, but this is what people believe. So because Mary Magdalene was Mary of Bethany, when Lazarus went to France with Martha and Mary, that Mary was Mary of Bethany and Mary, the same, Mary Magdalene. So they all went to France and they lived there and they died there. And that story also, as I said, has Mary going into a cave for 30 years, which is a stoic type of a thing anyway. Even if she did commit a sin, you don't go to a cave for 30 years. But I talk about this being an improbable opinion for, a couple, for, four, for four reasons. It has no link with tradition. It is unseemly. It doesn't seem right that she should go to France and not stay in the Holy Land. Why France at that time even? Why did they all go to France? I mean, they were so holy and close to the Lord. The apostles were the ones that were sent out to preach. Yeah, but they still came back home. And they never said they lived in France. They, or Thomas lived in India. They may have died there as a martyr, but it wasn't their home. It's like they went there and made France their home. It's just unseemly. It doesn't seem right. Never seemed right to me even. It just seemed kind of weird. Now, also, three, it upholds the improbable opinion that Mary Magdalene was a notorious sinner. Because in that legend, Mary Magdalene is presented as a notorious sinner, and she's the same person as the Lazarus' sister, Mary of Bethany. And it's stoic. It's got her going in a cave for 30 years. Now, we'll start out here with it has no link with tradition. And has no link with tradition because this legend did not exist until the 11th century. Before that, it was believed that Mary Magdalene moved to Ephesus to live there with the Blessed Virgin Mary and die there. That is seemly. That, and this was what was held up until the 11th century. I'm going to read from the nominal Catholic encyclopedia on St. Mary Magdalene. The Greek church maintains that the saint retired to Ephesus with the Blessed Virgin Mary and died there. That her relics were transferred to Constantinople in 886 and are there preserved and preserved. Gregory of Tours, <clears throat> De Mac Miraculous, 1. 30, <clears throat> supports the statement that she went to Ephesus. However, according to French tradition, Mary, Lazarus, and some companions came to Marseille and converted the whole of province. Magdalene is said to have returned to a hill, La Sainte Bome, nearby, where she gave her life up to Pennis for 30 years. Now, the other thing, they, some people will say this. Okay, Mary Magdalene was not Mary of Bethany. There were two different people, but they all went to France. Now you got four people going there. Lazarus, Mary of Bethany and Martha, and Mary Magdalene. They're not the same person, but they all went anyway. And Mary's still the sinner. Now we're going to read from the nominal Catholic Encyclopedia on St. Lazarus of Bethany, <laughs> reputed first bishop of Marseille. I'm going to give you the legend here, okay? Died in the second half of the first century. According to a tradition, or rather a series of tr traditions combined with different epics, the members of the family of Bethany, the friends of Christ, together with some holy woman and others of his disciples, were put out to sea by the Jews, hostile to Christianity, in a vessel without sails, oars, or helm. And after a miraculous voyage, landed in Provence at a place called, today called Santas Maris. It is related that they separated there to go and preach the gospel in different parts of southwest Gaul. First of all, women don't preach the gospel. He doesn't say women to preach the gospel, right? Lazarus, of whom alone we have to treat here, went to Marseille and having converted a number of inhabitants to Christianity, became their first pastor. During the first persecution under Nero, he hid himself in a crypt over which the celebrated Abbey of St. Victor was constructed in the 5th century. In the same crypt, he was interred when he shed his blood for the faith. During the new persecution of Domitian, he was cast into prison and beheaded on the spot, which is believed to be identical with a cave beneath the prison of St. Lazari. His body was later translated to Autonne and buried in the cathedral of that town, but the, by, but the inhabitants of Marseille claimed to be in possession of his head, which they still venerate. Now, that's what the legend is. Like the other legends concerning the saints of the Palestinian group, 
This tradition, which was believed for several centuries and which still finds some advocates, has no solid foundation. It, 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 is a, it, it is in a writing contained in the 11th century manuscript and some other documents related to St. Magdalene of Vezelay that we first read of Lazarus in connection with the voyage that brought Magdalene to Gaul. Before the middle of the 11th century, there does not seem to be the slightest trace of the tradition according to which the Palestinian saints came to Provence. At the beginning of the 12th century, perhaps, through a confusion of names, it was believed that Autan, that the tomb of St. Lazarus was to be found in the cathedral dedicated to St. Azarius. A search was made and remains were discovered, which were solemnly translated and were considered to be those of him whom Christ raised from the dead. But it was not thought necessary to inquire why they should be found in France. We have a lot of examples like that. We have relics that you would think somebody and are not in the history of the church. Now, the question, however, deserved to be examined with care, seeing that according to a tradition of the Greek church, the body of St. Lazarus had been brought to Constantinople, just as all the other saints of the Palestinian group were said to have died in the Orient and to have been buried, translated, and honored there. It is only in the 13th century that the belief that Lazarus had come to Gaul and his two sisters had been, uh, and his two sisters and had been the Bishop of Marseille spread to Provence. There it is. No link with tradition. Another one of these things that's coming in around the Scholastic Era kind of thing that where they came up with this story. And there's other diabolical things about this story. Uh, the, one of the most things is it re represents Mary as a notorious sinner, and she wasn't Mary Magdalene, and it's and it, it's stolen by putting her in a cave for 30 years, and it's unseemly. And, and this is the Da Vinci Code bases a lot of her heretical crap on this, where they're trying to say that Jesus married, married Mary Magdalene in France. He, he bases this whole thing on this. See, Mary Magdalene has been taking some hits all these years, and, it, and she, her name needs to be, you need to know what, the, what I really firmly believe to be the truth about her. You know, and we're gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to end talking more about that. I, I want to stay on this topic for right now. Anyway, I said it's unseemly and it's stoic. It's stoic because they got her in the cave for 30 years. Even if you're a, the word David's. So after David sinned, he committed adultery and murder. Should he have gone in a cave? He, he stayed. He beat, God kept him king. He was very holy and did a lot of good work. Anyway, now, and why did she wait to go to France to hide? I mean, she wasn't hiding in the Holy Land. She was going around with Jesus and the companions. She went into the tomb and she went and told the apostles. She wasn't hiding then. Why did she wait till she went to France to start hiding? Now, I just want to quote where Pope St. Gregory the Great taught this about Mary Magdalene. It's in his homilies on the Gospels, and he taught it in 591, homily 33. You're going to get some, some of these guys come up with some crazy things. They just like to make things up. Now, I'll, I'll talk about the, the, the consequences of this when I'm done, but let me first quote it. She whom Luke calls the sinful woman, whom John calls Mary, we believe to be the Mary from whom seven devils were ejected, according to Mark, what did these seven devils signify? If not all the vices, now he's saying she was guilty of all vices, seven vices, not just one thing. It is clear that the woman previously used the ungent to perfume her flesh in forbidden acts, which she therefore displayed more scandalously. She was now offering to God a more praiseworthy manner. Now he's saying the ointment that, he, she, that she used on Jesus, she used it when she was a whore. But where did he get it from, is what I'm saying. What, 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 what are you making it up for? Where are you getting that from? Now we're going to read where St. Augustine of Hippo taught that St. Mary of Bethany was the same woman as the sinful woman in Luke 7, and therefore she was a notorious sinner. His opinion is not as bad as uh, Gregory the Great's on Mary Magdalene, because he's trying to look at the... It's still wrong, though. It's still not good. I mean, he's trying to say, hey, they both anointed his feet, therefore. It's still not good. But I want to give it to you to let you know. This is the first proof I have of any church father teaching Mary Bethany was a sinner. He doesn't believe Mary Bethany was Mary Magdalene. He doesn't teach Mary Magdalene was a sinner, but he says Mary Bethany was because he links her with the sinful woman in Luke 7. This is not the harmony of the Gospels, year 400, chapter 79, one, paragraph 154, 154. This is not, however, to suppose that the woman who appears in Matthew was an entirely different person from the woman who approached the feet of Jesus on the occasion in the character of a sinner and kissed them and washed them with her tears and wiped them with the hair, that's Luke 7, and anointed them with an ointment in reference to whose case Jesus also made use of the parable of two debtors and said that her sins, were, which were many, were forgiven her because she loved much. But my theory, see, he doesn't, he's, at least he's not putting it forward as absolute, my theory. My theory is 
that this was the same Mary who did this deed on two separate occasions. The one being that which Luke has put on record when she approached him, first of all, in that remarkable humility with those tears and obtained forgiveness of her sins. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. But this statement, John attests what Luke has told us when he records a scene of this nature in the house of a certain Pharisee whose name was Simon. Here then we see that Mary had acted in this way before that time. And what she did a second time in Bethany is a different matter. See, he didn't, he's not, that's an out-of-sequence event. He thinks it's not. And so, I, like I said, even, even if it's not out of a sequence, you still can't link it with the sinful woman in Luke 7. But it's an out-of-sequence event. He's clearly referring in Luke 11, John 11 to what he mentioned in John 12, 3. It's the exact same event. Oh, well, anyway, he has, he's, he's basing it on something, but it's still wrong what he did here, okay? Now, we're going to end this lecture with the culpability of the people that are involved that made these statements. And I call them rash judgments. There is a penalty to pay for all of this. These are smart men. Now, we're talking about St. Augustine and St. Gregory the Great. I still believe they're saints, but I want to tell you what their sin is, and it's still a sin. And this bases upon a fact where I'm going to tell you something here, which most people, I believe that even your greatest saints that are in heaven right now, most of them had to go to purgatory before they went to heaven, even saints, unless they died as martyrs. If they didn't die as martyrs, even your greatest church fathers and your greatest saints had to go to purgatory. That's why there's a purgatory. You make a mistake like this. It's not, what was the sin that was committed? Okay. What's the sin of calumny? When you, when you accuse somebody of something that you have no certain proof, you, sus, you can have a suspicion that somebody's guilty of something, but that's a suspicion. You can even have a great suspicion, and you can say, I have a great suspicion, but you cannot say with certainty that therefore this person definitely was a sinner without proof. That's calumny. And you can't even say that somebody's suspect of a crime unless you have some proof for it, because then it scars the person's name. When you have no proof for it, that's calumny. You should not do that. These were smart men. That's why they incur here's and they started this story. So now, here's Saint Gregory the Great committed a venial sin of calumny, and so did your, uh, Augustine. Venial sin of calumny. Augustine not as great because he's trying to link, but it's still a venial sin of calumny because Mary Magdalene was not a notorious sinner, and neither is Mary of Bethany, and there is no certain proof or any probable proof even in the Bible that proves they were. What do we do? We had. People in here were, we accused some person of a, a, a crime that he may have committed. He was gravely suspect. And we said, be careful, don't tell nobody about it until we get all the facts. And it really pointed to him. But we found out it wasn't him. So we, we, we didn't even, we said, don't tell anybody, don't even accuse him of being, just say he's suspect unless investigated. If you see a guy, a brother, walking out of a bar and he trips over a rock and you just see him trip and you think he's drunk. And you say, hey, a brother went into the bar and he got drunk. And he tripped over a rock and you don't know that. Gregory, now, here's when it becomes a mortal sin. If you tell a story like this out of malice, because you hate the person, because you just want to get him. Now, that's, Gregory the Great didn't hate, he didn't do it because he hated Mary Magdalene. He just wanted, it was real nice and neat to fit. They did a lot of allegorical stuff. If you go on reading, he said, she, she, her seven devils, her seven vices, and he goes over each vice about what she was guilty of. Where is he getting all this from? That's one of them Greek things I can't stand, their allegory. They misuse allegory. So he, but he wasn't really malicious toward, towards Mary Magdalene. And, but he, he was thinking because of the seven devils. But it's still wrong what he did, okay? Because he was not malicious, it wasn't a mortal sin. But folks, it was a venial sin what he did. He gave her a bad reputation with no proof. And now it's in, in the uh, 12th and 13th century when it was, they started to become common, they can use him. And St. Augustine too committed a venial sin of calumny against St. Mary, Mary of Bethany. His sin wasn't as bad as Gregory's the Great because he, he's trying to link it to maybe to Luke 7. But it was still a venial sin because he's a smart man. Is that enough evidence in court to, to convict somebody in today's court? Well, we had this sinful woman over here anointed. They don't tell you who she was. And she anointed, it says she anointed Jesus' feet in Luke 11 too. So therefore, she's the same woman. How, how could you make that connection with any type of probability of him? You, now, even, at least they should have said this. And you can't even say this, really, because there's no suspicion even. They said, even though I said this, we have no proof of it. So I really, then you shouldn't say it, you see. So they're guilty. They are guilty of venial sins, and I believe it. Many, Almost every saint that's in heaven who didn't die as a martyr had to, had to go to purgatory. There's venial sins we commit. There's things that we do and, and, and to be perfect and holy. I see what God does in my life even. The venial sins, he punishes, punishes severely even for that because he wants to purify you. 
But no, very few saints are so great, except for maybe St. Joseph, the Blessed Virgin Mary, some, where they haven't done something that, that's at least a venial sin. So what I'm saying here with Pope St. Gregory the Great, he's still a great saint, very great pope, but he committed, at least from the information I have, folks, I haven't read all his works yet, but he seems to be very good to me. But in this case, he committed a venial sin, I'm sorry. Now, what happens to all the people that are following this opinion, like you and I did, and all of us did, and all these movies, we're not guilty of anything. Because we're believing what they told us, and they come out, and so we're just taking it for granted, and we're not looking at all the evidence. Unless you read the Bible, and you're like we do. We would know it, because we read the Bible every day now, and we're reading the and you study the theology behind it. Like, now I presented this lecture to you. After you've heard this lecture, you better not start going around calling her a notorious sinner anymore. Just say, that opinion we have no proof of. It's improbable. Just say what I told you if you heard my lecture. If you continue to do it after this, then you're going to be even in more trouble with God. But all of us that believe that, we're not committing any sin. We're just believing what they told us. We're figuring, these are church fathers, and all these people are teaching it, and so you didn't have a chance to investigate it, so you believe it. You don't commit a sin, any sin. But if you had a chance to study it, if you had a reason to investigate it, if you looked at the evidence, and then you don't acknowledge it, you're in trouble. St. Gregory the Great and uh, St. Augustine were very smart people, great theologians. They knew all the texts. It was very bad what they did on this. Like, all the venial sin is still bad. I'm sorry. You just don't go around calling somebody a notorious sinner when you don't have certain evidence. And they did it with St. Mary Magdalene and St. Mary Bethany. So we're going to try to restore their name here now. And I firmly believe, without a doubt, that St. Mary Magdalene was never a notorious sinner, was a very holy person. And it's the main proof I use still is that she was never mentioned as a notorious sinner. And if Christ wanted to show his great mercy through her because he forgives such a sinner, why didn't he refer to her once in the whole Bible as a notorious sinner? Seven devils being cast out of her don't mean anything. I proved that to you already in this lecture. So this is in reparation for the, uh, the uh, how they ruined uh, the reputation of St. Mary Magdalene and St. Mary of Bethany. And I'm not going to get in, in when I got, I'm going to put the book out here. I'm almost done. It's an article, not even a book. I have an article. You're, you're going to, you, since the 12th or 11th century forward, you're going to find this all over the place with the, uh, with the apostates. In the imitation of Christ, it's in uh, apostate Loyola, uh, Ignatius Loyola spiritual exercises. It's in um, Emmerich, the infamous apostate Catherine Emmerich with her goofy prophecies about there's people on the moon that uh, pagans were saved when Jesus went down to hell, and that uh, we gave, we had a lot of things that she taught. Oh, she taught that there were more people on the ark, like 50 people or something. It wasn't just no I just want to tell you about what she here. Here's what she taught about it. Let's just give you one example, okay? I got a lot of them. Oh, I was talking to Jesus, and then Mary Magdalene came along, and I saw her, and he, said, and he was telling me about Mary Magdalene. And he said, you know what? Mary Magdalene was uh, uh, Lazarus' sister, but here's Lazarus' family. There was Lazarus, Lazarus. then he had a sister called Mary who was a, a simpleton. <coughs> and they didn't talk about her much, like a, a retard or something. They locked her in the basement. That's what he said. Were, and, and then there was another Mary, Magdalene. And then there was Martha, so they had two Marys. He had two sisters named Mary. One was a simpleton. They locked her in the basement. He says, you don't hear about her much. And, and, and then there was another Mary. That's the Magdalene. And then there was a Martha, so there were four in his household. Then it says that Mary Magdalene moved into Magdala in Galilee, and she lived there in a big castle in a tower, big castle, big tower, and she was raised there by some nurse or something, and she's getting to the whole story. She gets into all these details, right? And that the first time she committed her prostitution and, 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 and whoring around was when she was nine years old, and she gets into the whole thing, you know, all right? She's the one that believes that there's, the moon is made of cheese and there's people walking around down in the moon. Refer to my article titled Against Padre Pio and Catherine Emmerich, but it's in my refutation section on my menu. And you're going to see some of the crazy stuff she taught. But my main thing is that, but a lot of these people that are just going along with this, I'm not saying they're all guilty for saying it. But I am saying if you're Ignatius Lowe, you're a theologian and you're saying it, you're in deeper trouble. Aquinas taught it, and you're in deeper trouble if you're a theologian. You really are. You really are. You at least get, these guys are apostates anyway. But all I'm saying is, like us, we read the Bible every day, you know, you say, there's no proof of this in here. And all the movies then, therefore, go out and take this out of context. I'm like, you can still watch these movies. But I'm just, for the record, letting you know, for their reputation, you got to be careful when you do these things. You see how things spread, too? How these things spread, how these lies. You look at it, it Gregory the Great was guilty of a venial sin, I'm sorry. And I guarantee he had to do quite a few, quite a lot of time in purgatory for this. I still believe he's a saint. 
But I tell you something, and I don't believe neither one of them two did it maliciously. I don't. I, I, they're trying to make a good example in the Bible about, hey, uh, a really horrible, notorious sinner, seven devils, seven vices. And he goes, the vice, and then he's getting into all these vices. Where did you get this from? Where did you get this from? See, and now they have a church father to rest on. Now, I'm going to end the lecture right here. I have not found any other church father or anti-church father and the nominal Catholic Encyclopedia, I don't have a quote here off my hand, I'm going to say it. It says, the Greek church, all believe, all of them believe Mary Magdalene was, was holy. She was not a sinner. And it says, most of the Latins believe that she was a sinner and could link her with all three people. That's what the Catholic, uh, nominal Catholic Encyclopedia says. Most of the Latins are in the West, believe that she was all three of these people or whatever. They, it's, that's a lie. It's a lie, you see. Now, if you're reading that nominal Catholic Encyclopedia and you believe it, and, and I'm not blaming other people because they don't have time to study like I studied it. You would believe he's telling you the truth. He's a liar. He's telling you lies like we see today in the mass media. They lie unbelievable, like Pilate wanted to kill Christ. I look at the image, it's not there. Why some of these people want to keep riding with this? It's just because they, go, so, because they believed it for so long. It's a nice example of God's mercy, forgiving sinners. you got plenty of that in the Bible. You don't need her. You don't need to take a, a just person and say that God you know, may turn her into a sinner. And so that's what happened with St. Mary Magdalene and St. Mary of Bethany. So we pray during this resurrection season, especially for the intercession of St. Mary Magdalene and St. Mary of Bethany and Lazarus and Martha, who are dragged into this and all that, who I believe very firmly, St. Mary of Bethany and even Mary Magdalene, firmly believe they were very holy people and they were never notorious sinners. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.